Hey there crew and welcome back to my channel. So I've been asked how I make time lapses. Today I'll be explaining to you everything I can about it. I'll be making an in-depth video about how you can shoot, edit, export and upload your time lapse to your social media pages on a whole host of different devices. So obviously you'll need a couple of things to make it possible. One, obviously a camera with an SD card in it. Two, a tripod or some mount that you can keep your camera steady with. Three, you'll need software to process it on a computer. And four, uh, an internet connection to upload your video. Number one, camera. Now I'll be the first to say that you don't actually need a DSLR to do it, um, but that is how I do mine. You can also shoot your time lapses on a phone or on a sport camera, on an iPad or something like that. Each camera has its limitations. Uh, for example, phones usually only have about a two to five megapixel uh, sensor in them and limited ISO options, but uh, for a lot of different circumstances you don't need a wide range of high-tech camera gear to get the desired outcome that you're going for. Anyway, let's have a closer look at a couple of different cameras that you can use to do this kind of photography. Number 1.1, DSLRs. DSLR specs vary from body to body, but all of the recent DSLRs at least have an APS-C sized sensor in them. That means you'll have a greater range of shutter, ISO, aperture and picture resolution options. So for example on my camera I can shoot photos that are actually at a higher resolution than that of the 4K video format. Some DSLRs have a time-lapse feature inbuilt to them um, but a lot of them do not and for this you'll need to buy yourself one of these which is a remote. They also vary from model to model um, but for basic purposes you can pick one up for $50. With it I'm able to set a delay um, how long I would like the exposure to go for, and the time between each photo, as well as obviously the amount of photos, and I can also mute the remote's beep noises. My DSLR is the Canon EOS 600D or the Rebel T3i. Its ISO ranges go between ISO 100 to 6400. This really opens up the range of subjects that you can shoot, and especially when you put on a low light lens like 50mm 1.8 or an 18 to 35 1.8 you can photograph a great deal of things. Which lens should I use? I'm glad you asked. Each lens has their own niche use, but if you're doing, for example, a time lapse of clouds moving over the sky, then you'd want to get as much in as you can. So I'd go for an ultra wide angle like the 10 to 20 millimeter that Sigma has, or the 11 to 16 millimeter f2.8 constant aperture. At least that's the one that I want. If you're doing a time lapse of a flower opening, for example, you might want to use a lens with a little bit more zoom on it and a lower aperture, like the 50mm 1.8 that I told you about before. It has a very touchy um, focus and a bokeh background when you put it to 1.8, so you'll only have the fat flower in focus. Number 1.2, mirrorless cameras. Mirrorless cameras are different to those of the DSLRs just because of their architecture, they're just built a little bit differently. And because of this, they're better at some things and worse at others. It's really up to you which one you go for. I'll go into a more in-depth review of the difference between mirrorless and DSLR cameras in future videos. But basically, uh, mirrorless cameras are better for video and mirrored cameras are better for photos. I don't actually own a mirrorless camera myself, although I'm pretty keen to get one. But as far as I know, um, a lot more mirrorless models have uh, more features inbuilt, like a time-lapse feature. So you wouldn't need to get a remote with them, but I'm sure in some models you still would. Number 1.2, your phone. Yep, you heard me right. This hunk of junk can become your time-lapse buddy. There are many apps that you can download on the Google Play Market for your phone to create time-lapses for you. I've downloaded and tested one, and I'm quite impressed and happy with it. And I think I might even buy the full version. I'm not sure if the Windows or Apple markets have uh, apps like this in it, but I'm sure they would. The app that I used was called Lapsit, and it's basically an all-in-one time-lapse software. Really easy to use, just real good quality. With the free version, you're able to set up your phone to take photos at a millisecond, second or minute intervals, tell it how many photos, or how long you want it to shoot for, or limit it by your discretion. You can choose what resolutions you'd like to shoot it at from a range of popular and widely used resolutions, for example 240p, 480p, 360p, 720p, 1080p. You can also make it shoot at the camera's full resolution, which in my phone is 5 megapixels, 
um, but I might add that um, only up to 480p is available in the free version. You can change the focus mode as well as having the shutter sound enabled or disabled and you can even have the camera capturing photos while the screen is locked to save battery. This is the main view from the app. As you can see here you can change the millisecond interval or seconds or minutes and uh, you can change the resolutions from here but as well uh, it's just like Instagram you can add in your own uh, color effects on here so you can change it into black and white if you wanted to or you can change it into sepia or you know stuff like that negative if you're feeling pretty keen and there's a whole lot more and you'll find out when you go and have a look really I'm not going to leave it on negative I'm going to put it to sepia for now I've got it set to one photo every 100 milliseconds and I'm just going to click on this button adjusting focus, preparing capture first frame, second frame, third frame fourth frame, fifth frame and it just keeps on going on like that until I tell it to stop because that's the mode I've got it set in at the moment I can pause it and continue the capture again once I've got it in the right spot by pressing this button or once I'm happy with it I can click on the stop button um, before I'll do that I'll show you that I can lock the screen and then it's still going how good is that All right, let's stop it alright Here's the edit view. It's the info. I've got it. It was started at this time, 29 frames and 36 seconds at 480p, and it tells you how much space it's used 1.34 megabytes. I can put it in a square mode, which I haven't really tried out just yet, um, but I assume it's for, you know, for Instagram. I can flip it, loop it, change the orientation, or I can resume it, or I can just go through and um, edit it and export it, which is pretty exciting if you ask me. But I'm just going to leave it at that, but as you can see, you can change the starting frame and ending frame. And you can put in a number here if you want, if you know which frames is where it's good. But we'll leave it as one. I can put effects on here, so if I didn't already have sepia on, I could turn like stuff like black and white or negative or whatever from here. Um, in, the fr in the full version, you can add in music, which is pretty awesome. Or you can just render it. And here, what's this? Yeah, this is how many frames per second you want to add it in, so I usually put it to 30 or 25. And um, you can choose which rendering em engine and stuff you use from here. Since I don't have a newer phone, I can't use the awesome uh, render engine, which is just H264, which I might add is pretty awesome. But um, I can still use MP4, so that's pretty good. Video test. Format MP4, resolution 480p, quality high, 10,000 kilobytes per second, effect none, 1 to 29 frames, 30 frames per second, 0 0.96 seconds, sounds good. And then you'll see here, it's rendering the video, shows you the frames as it goes, and it should be done soon. Alright. It was successful, so straight from here I can share it, which is this publish button. I can close or I can play it. Let's just give it a go. There it is. Real, real, real exciting. And then it brings it back to this screen. So that's pretty cool. Once you've got it done, you can go into the gallery and see which... Um, see, there's your frames. This is your rendered section. And here's some other time lapses that you've already done. Um, they're not coming up because I've actually removed them from my phone. That's because it saved it directly to the hard drive, and my phone hard drive's almost full. But, you can view them from here, and restart them. You can zip them and send them, you can hide them, you can view details. It's real good. I might also mention that uh, the app saves each photo after it takes it, as opposed to uh, saving it to RAM or something. So if your phone, for some reason, turns off, you've still got all of your frames that you've already captured. I've actually tested this one and I flattened my battery doing a time lapse, came back later on and all the frames were there, it was great. Uh, if you couldn't read it back there, only Android version 4.3 or later can use the H.264 rendering engine. This app's uh, really exciting me, it really, uh, I can use my phone for time lapses, how good is that? 
Uh, the ad doesn't have any ads in it at all, and uh, the full version is only $2. Two. Great value. Props to Interactive Universe for a great app. Number 1.3, Sport Cameras slash GoPros. If you haven't already seen a time lapse by a GoPro or Sport Camera, I'd have to say you'd be living under a rock. They have an inbuilt. Uh, GoPros have a wide angle, so they capture a lot, and they've got a software that comes with the GoPro which allows you to edit them. Despite not having a screen on them, they still capture them really well. Number two, tripod. Now this can be anything really, as long as it keeps your camera stable, or not stable depending on what you like. You could have it strapped to a car, you could have it blue tacked to a wall, you could have it on, or you could just have it on a tripod. All those work. Why, you ask? Well, <clears throat> your camera will be set up for a long period of time and you need the action to happen in the frame, not on the camera. Number three, software. It's a fairly simple thing to edit. It's just layering images one frame after the other and then putting music to it or not. Any of your Apple iMovies, Adobe Creative Suite, Premieres, or Sony Vegas Movie Studios would do fine. Which one, you ask? Well, that's really up to you. They all have lots of different things that are good and bad about them, um, but for something like a time-lapse, I don't really think it matters that much. D it depends how you like to work. I personally use Premiere, but I also keep uh, Sony Vegas on hand. Uh, sometimes I need it to do some of things that Premiere doesn't. How, you ask? Well, uh, in Premiere, what you have to do is, um, well, if you want to keep it neat, um, well, you set up your project first, so... Uh, for me, I'd be probably doing a 1920 by 1080 project uh, with 30 frames per second. Once I've got all that, then I uh, have to import all of the photos into a folder, and then um, put all the photos in the folder on the stage, and then change the length of the track from 5 seconds, which is the default, down to 1 millisecond. Now, if you shot all your clips in 16 by 9, then all you have to do is select all of them, and right click on them, and then go scale to frame size, and it will fit exactly the right size, but if you shot it in the traditional uh, 3x2, then what I do is I nest all of the images by going right click nest, and then um, within that uh, framework, I then do what I just said, which is scale to frame size, close it, and then I resize the nested frame to about 107%, so that it fits into the 16x9, and if I want to, I'll either move it up or down, uh, depending on the time-lapse. Rinse and repeat until all your time-lapses are inside your project. Add your music in and line it up however you like to, whatever other editing you got to do, and then get ready for export. Now with web videos, I always use um, MP the MP4 file type with the H.264 encoder, uh, because I find it's the, just the best all-round encoder for uh, quality and a smaller file size. Uh, the only downside is it takes a little bit longer than the other encoders to encode. I won't explain exactly how it works, but it's essentially JPEG video. So this is where we choose our resolution and our quality and every other setting you can think of. Um, you can choose to leave it in CBR or constant bitrate, um, but I prefer to put it into variable bitrate or VBR um, because it gives a better quality and small file size as well. Um, but of course it takes longer to export. I usually set up my uh, quality settings manually, but if, you not, if you're not sure what quality settings you should use, um, you may as well just use the YouTube standards. And there you have it, your video is finished and it's ready to upload. You can put it on YouTube, uh, Facebook, MySpace, or any other site. But if you do want to put it on Instagram, then obviously it needs to be a square. If you try and upload a, for example, uh, 16.9 video to Instagram through the Instagram app, then it will just choose the center square of that video, thereby cutting off these sides. But if you don't want to do that, then you'll have to make a separate project to so the one you've just made and make it into a 650 by 650 pixel project and do all the things I've already said. If I've get it, got any info wrong, please comment below. If you have any more questions, put them in the download. Um, yeah, thanks for watching. I hope this helped you. Um, and if it has inspired you to add and do one, share, put a link down below and I'll check out your time lapse when I can. Thanks for watching. I'll leave you with the time lapses that I shot on my phone and a couple I've done on my DSLR.
Mothership can't save you, so your ass is gone. 